Welcome to Hello Self. It's a podcast focused on turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I am your host, coach, and author, Patricia Leonard. Hello there. I am Patricia Leonard, your host for Hello Self Podcast. It's an exciting time that I'm going through with this Law of Attraction series, and I'm really enjoying it and the research of it and experiencing uh, much of it in my own life. I've heard it said before, when we write a book, it ends up being about ourselves. When we write a song, it's something that's gone on or is going on in our life. So I think that the... In this law of attraction regarding relationships, I'm seeing it much broader than I started out. Relationships is everything, and love is everything. I hope you're enjoying these as much as I'm enjoying doing the research and learning about myself. Because remember, Hello Self podcast and Hello Self in general, is about getting to know who we are. And the purpose and the mission of this podcast is to help you turn your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. Get to know who you are and what the desires of your heart are and get those dreams and goals off that someday shelf. That's what we always say here. So anyway, today... I will be highlighting, this is series number seven, and the law of attraction regarding relationships. And I'd like to say that it's relationships in every aspect of our life, in corporate America, in family, in community, in church, in wherever you are, sports event, but it's about relationships in every aspect of our life and how important they are. And we sometimes forget that. So the series today is number seven, and I'll be talking about seven types of love experiences. If you have been following the podcast in the closing of series number six, I promise to cover in number seven, the seven types of love experiences that Robert Sternberg mentioned as an outcome of one of a combination of his three components. And just in review, Robert Steinberg designed or came up with the triangular theory of love. He was one of the most influential psychiatrists, psychologists, excuse me, of the 20th century known for his groundbreaking research on love. His triangular theory of love outlines that love is understood by applying three components. And we reviewed these last time, but I want to go back because I'm now taking you on the next step of his understanding of the, the love experiences that each of these components impact. So the first one that he talked about in his triangular theory is passion. The second one is intimacy. And the third one is commitment. This theory that suggests that people can have varying degrees of intimacy, passion, and commitment at any time. It's another way to look at relationships and where we are in that relationship. According to the theory, true love is achieved when all three components are achieved. So what he's saying is we may only be in a passion state. And remember, that can be the relationship not only with other human beings, with, but with the desires of our career, or where we want to live, we mentioned this before. But the he's saying that when all three of these components are involved in the relationship or the love experience, 
the, then that is what true love is. And this is a way for you to look at your own relationships. Where am I? Am I in an intimate state, a passion state, a commitment state? And do your own analysis. How do you feel about this person? After all, this event, this uh, podcast series started from uh, 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 something that I felt. And I mentioned that in the very first one, but I didn't know what it meant. So this just is another way to look at what was that love experience. And not all of them are intimacy. Some of them are just passion, we said. So some of these components are focused on the love between two people in a romantic or sexual relationship, but they also may apply to other forms of interpersonal relationships, as we shared in the last podcast and as I just did in the opening. Now, I just want to go through each of these three components that... Um, Robert Steinberg is talking about here. So intimacy, he says, when, which involves feelings of closeness, connectedness, and bondedness. This can relate to individuals that work together, pray together, sports. And I think I brought up the last time, specifically in Series 6, because we were going through the Olympic Games. And you can see the intimacy piece is the closeness that the teams felt with each other and were cheering for each other. That is one form that he talks about. Passion, which involves feelings and desires that lead to physical attraction, romance, and sexual, and may begin with closeness. So you can you see it can start with the intimacy and then develops to the next level. So the first component might simply be <clears throat> that you're feeling closeness. The next component, passion, you can start to see, yeah, it's a combination of closeness, but there's more, which can be romance. It can be physical encounters or physical attractions, sexual attractions, and then commitment which involves feelings that lead to a person, lead a person to remain with someone and towards shared goals. What he's saying is a relationship can start out as intimacy and maybe that's where it stops. Or it might develop into passion, which takes that to the next level of where am I? This is a different level of love. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then it can go into commitment, which says, I want to be with you in this endeavor. I want, it could even be a project that you're working on and you're committed. It can be a marriage. You're committed. It's taking these three steps as a way to start thinking about relationships. Because many times we ask ourselves, am I feeling love about this person? What is this I'm feeling? And how do I evaluate it? All I know is it feels different. So I think sometimes without something that we can compare to, we may jump to conclusions and then find out later on. Remember the last time we had it, I talked about the apartment lease. That, that was one way of measuring, is it love or is it not? We can start to see that these are components and then start to say, how many of the components am I feeling here? Steinberg says that these three components of love interact in a systemic manner. The presence of one component or a combination of two or more components creates, he said, seven kinds of love but I'm going to introduce an eighth kind and you can start to see then what I mean. And I've written down notes here, so I'm going to be referring to these. So I stay committed to his research and his learning and his sharing. These types of love may vary over the course of a relationship. For example, a relationship could begin as passionate love. 
progress into romantic love, and then eventually into a state of companionate love. So you can see we can start here in the way we feel about an individual or a project that we're working on with an individual, because sometimes it's not necessarily going into a marriage or romance kind of state. It's simply saying, I want to work with this person. I like being around them. The, okay, so the first one that he talks about, and that's why I went ahead and made it eight, because he highlighted seven, but he also talked about number one, which is non-love. The first type of love that Steinberg introduces is when none of the three components are lo of love are present in the relationship. According to Steinberg, non-love can be seen as the casual interactions in our everyday lives and actually characterizes the majority of our personal relationships. So it doesn't, it's non-love, but it is something that we really enjoy working around that person or being around that person. And it doesn't necessarily take them into intimacy, passion, or commitment. These relationships and interactions contain a complete lack of none is of love, is what he says, as none of the components are involved. So you see, we just talked about that intimacy, passion, and commitment are not involved. This makes sense as people would typically express any sort of feelings of love for just a brief encounter in their lives. Having laid that groundwork now, we're going to go into the seven love experiences based upon his three components. The first is one of friendship. So this is moving into the love experiences involving his three components. As we discussed in series six, I mentioned each of these, but I did not go into detail about them. So we did talk about friendship, and I said, and I'll come back and uh, go deeper in number seven about what does that mean and how can I recognize it? So number one is friendship. The component there is liking. So it's like non-love, but liking. But it is a type of love experience, he says. This type of love is when the intimacy or liking component is present. So you like the person, and it's just at the beginning level. So that was one of the things that started me. I noticed something that an individual that I was working with did something, and I really liked that. Now, I had nothing to measure at that time because I didn't know, I hadn't done this research, so I didn't understand it, but it was something that was, the feeling was something that was brand new to me. I had never felt that before, but I did recognize the action, the behavior, the situation that caused me to pay attention and say, I really like that about that guy. But feelings of passion and commitment are the present. The, let me start that. The type of love is when the intimacy and liking components is present, but feelings of passion and commitment are not in, are, they're in the romantic sense. So that wasn't a romantic situation. I didn't know what it was. I knew it was a strong att uh, attraction. For example, you like someone for their kindness. That's exactly where I started. Playing tennis, you really enjoy their personality. Pickleball, or, or enjoying sports together, watching movies. And so I can see that a lot of my friendships, because I do the arts, so a lot of my friendships end up being around, and I feel very close to those people, but not necessarily into one of the top components like a passion or anything like that. I just like being around them, the closeness. Okay, number two that he talks about is infatuation. Now, the component there, he says, is passion. Let me explain what he says. 
Infatuation is characterized by feelings of lust and physical passion without without the liking. So it jumps right past it. You just feel this, oh my gosh, what is this I'm feeling? I want to... I want this guy to hug me. I want this person to hold me. I want more. There has been enough time for a deeper, there has not been enough time for a deeper sense of intimacy, romantic love, or consummate love to develop. So the only thing with infatuation, you know, is that you are really attracted. And he says from a lust standpoint, like you want to take it to the next level. You have felt that before, I'm sure. And then you went to your judgment and said, I'm married or this person is married or they're way out of my category of what I think I would like to be around. Or they're friends, my friend, and they're a partner of my friend or whatever. But you had felt those feelings of lust. These may eventually arise after the infatuation phase, the intimacy, romance. It doesn't mean that it's not going to develop there, but the initial phase is infatuation, and it's characterized by feelings of lust. The initial infatuation is often very powerful, and those are moments that we have to look at ourselves and say, what is, what do I believe? Do I want to throw myself out there now? And those are sometimes one night stands. People feel that sense of love and or lust and they say, oh yeah, right now, let's start, let's go. And, and there probably isn't anyone in this world who hasn't felt lust at some point. And then because of their commitments to themselves, they did not act on it. But this type that uh, this is the type that would mostly align with the idea of love at first sight. Now, it doesn't always have to be love at first sight, but it may never go anyplace else. Instead of love at first sight, I would say lust at first sight and is characterized by immediate and intense attraction to another person. So you can see that different and I or difference, and I know that each of you have had that. I have had it myself. And I didn't act upon it. Sometimes I did. <laughs> oh I, I don't want to get honest in here, huh? You may even question yourself with at that point of uh, the infatuation. I think I'm in love. Am I in love? Is this love? And sometimes we have to look, is it lust or love or is it something else because of their commitment to some of their sports or just like the thing that person did, I liked that a lot. And I wanted to know more about who he was. I wanted to know that's just one behavior. So you can't measure a full life <laughs> behavior. I like that. And then I think the same thing about lust. We cannot build our, some of us do. And then later on in passion, it, we find out that this wasn't the right thing to do. But I think it, it depends upon our judgment. And I think that these kind of things can help us walk through that in a more solid way with commitment to ourselves. So the question, I think I'm in love, but am I? That's at the infatuation. This type of love includes passion, but lacks the liking and commitment components of love. So you see that goes into passion. And let's look back at passion. It says involves feelings and desires that lead to physical attraction. So you may skip one, like the intimacy of liking. And jump right into passion. Yeah. <laughs> and then you ask yourself later, oh dear. But so it it beginning to look at yourself and 
what type of love is this? If I look at it from herbs, or what's his name again? Stern, yeah, Sternberg. If I take it from Sternberg's point of view, then it gives me a measurement point for myself. You, as a woman, you may be at the gym and see this hunk of a man, and you might feel lust right away. The man might see some woman, and he he feels lust right away. It doesn't mean we always act on it. And I think all that Robert Stein, Sternberg is talking about is giving us that, something to measure it on so we can get to know who are we. It's more about learning about hello self. Because then we look at other, instead of just acting on that specific attraction initially, we stop. And it keeps us more in alignment with our own commitment to self. So this is definitely another way of understanding self. This is exactly what I experienced that got me into creating the series on the law of attraction of relationships. And I told you that I really liked this behavior that this person did. And I was attracted to it. Okay, number three. In the love experiences, seven love experiences he's talking about here, empty love. The components are commitment. Now, this is going to blow your mind because you'd think that commitment is when we've walked through all of the components. That's not true. Sometimes we jump right into one and skip the others. So empty love, the components of Stein, Stern, I am going to call him Steinberg, of Sternberg's theory is that this is a commitment, component of commitment. Now listen to this, because you jump right into commitment. Empty love is characterized by commitment without passion or intimacy. At times, a strong love deteriorates into empty love. So it might have started out as a very strong love. Sometimes that's why people get divorces. Sometimes that's why people che cheat on their partners. They committed, but then it deteriorates into empty love. For instance, an arranged marriage may start as empty love, but flourish into another form of love over time. So it can go either way. It can go down as far as love, or it can become a stronger love. Either way. So we may have started for different reasons. Your parents wanted you to marry this person, and you went ahead and did it, and it didn't last. Or they wanted you to marry this person, and it ended up getting a stronger love. I, I think it's very interesting. I was brought up in a home where there was not to be sex before marriage. And I think it's very interesting. I, didn't com I did not commit that to myself. And the very first marriage I had, I had committed it, but I allowed myself to be taken in because of curiosity and lust, actually. And I ended up, the very first guy that I had a sexual encounter with, I ended up marrying. And I knew, it was funny, at my wedding, my mother said something about funeral. And she said, oh, sis, I'm sorry. I meant your wedding. But I think, <laughs> and looking back, I realized that what she had said was really the truth. It was a funeral. And that's exactly how it ended up for me is it did not work out. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And so after 10 months, I I went through a divorce. Not a nice one. However, a few years later, I met this person again, just in a mall. And my mother was with me. That's interesting. And we stood there. He tapped me on the shoulder and said, could I talk? 
And I said, yes, my mom is here. You're going to talk to both of us. And he said, yes, I want to. And he apologized for the behaviors that he had uh, treated me. But you know what? I jumped in knowing that wasn't what I believed in. And so it can empty love can either get better or get worse. So he is St Sternberg says the only true love is all three components. Four, number four of these love experiences is called romantic love. Now, this is interesting. The components here, and you might be able to start recognizing these and say, I know what the components are, is intimacy and passion. So romantic love bonds people emotionally through intimacy and physical passion. So this component is intimacy and passion for romantic love. Partners in this type of relationship have deep conversations that help them know intimate details about each other. So romantic love is a time where we want to get, it moves past just lust, and we want to know more about who the person is. And that's exactly what happened with me with that initial on liking the behavior that I wanted to know more about who is this person and what do they really believe in and stand for? So romantic love then starts to move into a deeper understanding of each other. They enjoy sexual passion and affection. So it, it's um, taking it to a more understanding and out of just the lust feel. And it may not go into a sexual kind of thing. However, the intimacy, feeling of connectedness, that person, and then the passion, the closeness is taken to another step. It does not necessarily mean a sexual step. Still undecided, and this is still about romantic love, still undecided about long-term commitment or future plans. So it's just but a sexual desire or love exists of some kind. And I think that uh, it's, it's a point where we, again, have that closeness, but not next necessarily the feeling of lust at this point. But he said a sexual desire or eros love exists. And what is eros love? It's a Greek word meaning the type of love that involves passion, lust, and romance. So it can go to that. <laughs> that involves all three of the, or well, the two with lust included in that. So it can bring in passion and romance and lust. It just depends on what the next, how the, when they begin to know each other a little bit better, what evolves after that. How do you show Eros love? E-R-O-S love. Eros is a primal love that comes as a nat nat natural instinct for most people and is displayed through physical affection. Now, this is very interesting because I am a hugger. I like, I like the aspects of the, that type of affection. And I feel that toward everybody I meet. I, I don't know. Even in the corporate world, I remember one time I was in Chicago and this woman, that I, this professional that I was meeting was upstairs and it was in a big office, tall office building. And I thought to myself, am I going to shake her? Because we had talked on the phone several times before I came to do consulting with her organization. And so I sat down there, or stood down there in the lobby, and I thought to myself, will we shake hands or will we hug? I didn't know, and I had that decision, what will I do? It was very interesting. She got off the elevator, and she walked toward me, and we both started to put out our hands, but we ended up hugging. 
it was because of the deep conversations we had with each other about, not about lust, not about love, but about who we are. And we liked that person. We liked each other. And we wanted to show affection. And that's one way of doing it. So this romant, these romantic behaviors of Eros love, however you say it, but are, they're not limited to kissing, hugging, and holding hands, engaging in a game of footsie. Those are some of their, they include those, but they're not limited to those. Stroking the person's hair, opening to the energy that awakens in us as we do this. And I think that is the love we feel when we may be uh, hugging somebody else. What is it we feel? It makes me feel joy because I truly love everybody. I know some of my professionals will be on the telephone and I'll hang up and I'll say, love you, see you tomorrow or whatever. And at first, I think there's a dead, slight dead silence, but now they're getting used to it because that's just who I am. And you know what? I really never... It's not that I disrespect the professional world or the hierarchy that we live in our society. It's not that I disrespect them. It's that I actually respect them. Now, some people, if they don't want to hug, they do not have to embrace it. And I don't just go up and grab them and no, if I come to ward or I may say, how about a hug? Some days we just need a hug for a stop. But going back to this Eros love, this is going beyond a performance mindset into a joyous surrender to pleasure. And that is exactly what I feel. Each of us are love. And the embracing of that love within each of us is very critical. And our society has set us up to say, oh, no, you don't touch people. I remember when I was in corporate personnel with this major company. I boss was a male boss, and we were going to lunch one day. And in the wide open, it was in the daytime. When we got back, the vice president of that area called us in to his office and said, it'll be better if you don't go out the opposite sex for lunch or something like that. We were in a wide open space and I thought, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. And then no travel together. Let me tell you, it's different today than when I was in corporate America. Very different. And also the locations are a little bit different. This love is a desire for another person's physical body and is often driven by need. So eros love's move, it can start as just struck hugging, but it doesn't have to start there. And it doesn't have to mean that I lust for you. It depends upon, and I think that's why it's so important that Let's have a hug. We did a great job. But we have to know and let people know that this is not a behavior that we don't appreciate or respect them. You have to make a judgment about some things. But I love hugs. I love hugs. <laughs> okay, number five. I got to move along. Number five, compa companionate love. Components are liking and intimacy. Companionate love is an intimate but not passionate sort of love. It includes the intimacy or liking component and the commitment component of the triangle. So you can begin to see what these the companionate love is, how it is, and the intimacy in the liking. It is stronger than friendship because there is a long-term commitment but there is minimal or no sexual desire. So you can be friends forever. I, I think of my girlfriend's husbands and I are very good friends. 
but we do not do go beyond, and it's a long-term relationship, but we do not go beyond whatever boundary compassionate love brings for us. This type of love is often found in marriages where the passion has died. So it can be between friends, partners, and it can also be where the passion has died, but the couples continue to have deep affection and a strong bond. So they may not feel the same about each other, but they appreciate and respect. And sometimes they stay together. But they don't have, maybe there's no sexual activity in their relationship, but they stay together. This may also be viewed as a love between very close friends and family members. Firefighters, look at that. Police officers, community have companion love for their coworkers. So you can see what this plays out. Um, they look in the, when we, the soldiers, they'll die for each other. I got your back. I was told by somebody that I worked with, I got your back. And that's really what this is about. I got your back. And it's a commitment. It's a passion for a, uh, each other's success, it's a passion for working with the person, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean sexual, and that can happen in marriages too and relationships. Maybe they started out as sexual and then they end up being great friends and they change the component that they're worked that, that it started out in. You see how this begins to work. Number six is fatuous love. The components there are commitment and passion. In this type of love, commitment and passion are present while intimacy and liking is absent. Fatuous love is tip typified by a whirlwind courtship in which passion motivates a commitment without the stabilizing influence of in intimacy. Often witnessing this, leaves others confused about how the couple could be so impulsive. So it may be that somebody met somebody on a business trip and they immediately had this fatuous love. Doesn't have to be on a business trip, but it could be a teen running away with somebody, uh, somebody that they had this love feel for, but they didn't know. And they ran away to get married or ran away to be together. Example, a teen running away and going cross country with a person they really don't know just for the thrill of the experience. Sometimes it's the commitment and passion elements, the commitment to this moment and acting on the passion and the commitment. Okay, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. According to data collected in one piece of research, reproductive success may be greater in cases where women have fatuous love and men have empty love. The data shows that women feel, may feel, I don't want to say do, but may feel reproductive need. And so they'll have this encounter with somebody, a man, and the man may not feel the same level of love that the woman does because she has this other purpose, reproductive. And he is maybe, and I don't want to say this is just for men and women, but they've given me that example here, that a man may be less committed to the reproductive aspect of this factual love that she has and just more about the satisfaction of the encounter. However, marriages involve fatuous love often don't work out. So if that's where it started, 
then often they don't work out. Sometimes that's why we have children now and we're going through so much uh, in our lives right now about abortion and those kind of things. But I think that the women maybe went into that encounter in a whole different state of mind than the man did. Now, remember, this can also be the other way, but it's it doesn't come there's no commitment it's a commitment for what she wants to have a child and to follow through on her passion and he may totally be uh more not totally but maybe more in the passion of it kind of thing but the whole thing is i think that sometimes we don't think about those and we follow the fatuation aspect of it when they do, and okay, I said, however, marriages involving fatuous love often don't work out. But when they do, many chalk the success up to love because it didn't start out as love. Started out as a closeness and a commitment to do what we wanted to do now without regard for total love. It was much more about uh, the feelings that we had at that moment. We felt close to them. And we had a passion for maybe having children or a, a, for another thing. So we don't think about what comes out of that oftentimes. Okay, and number seven, we are here now. Consummate love, the components are intimacy, passion, and commitment. So what is consummate love? Consummate love is made up of all three components and is the total form of love. So it's another way for you to think about where am I in my relationships? It represents an ideal relationship. Couples who experience this kind of love have great sex several years into their relationship. They cannot imagine themselves with anyone else. The consummate love is it's intimacy. We feel all of those things, the closeness, the friendship, the attraction is deeper than, so in, than romance. It even goes into making a commitment that this is what I want. These couples also cannot see themselves truly happy without their partners. So they, they feel that sometimes people may call this past life loves and whatever. I don't know. I really don't know how I feel about all that. But I do know that there are people, there are males and females that I feel closer to, that I almost feel like I did know them before. It's just like everything clicks. So I'm not sure about all of this, and I'm not going to sit here and try to figure it out. I'm going to experience, as I go through each of my encounters with people, experience that what's happening. And it doesn't matter if it's, and I don't care how it fits, but these particular three components help me start to see where I am. Because remember, what started this is I didn't know. I thought, what am I feeling? Love is a verb. It says that couples cannot see themselves truly happy with someone else. We stop there. They manage to overcome differences and face stressors together. So that is consummate love. So they, whatever comes up, they are committed to one another, to partners and one another. And so if they come to this point where I don't feel the same about you as I did five years ago, what's so if we can sit down and talk about it, sometimes we can work through it in an adult uh, kind of way that nobody gets hurt. So I think part of this is just knowing or having a way to see where we are so we can have a conversation because I swear if people just talked, we would have a better world 
and not defending themselves, but talked and listened. Ver love is a verb. According to Steinberg, consummate love may be harder to maintain than it is to achieve. So it may start out easy as the components of love must be put into action. There may be an intimate feeling, a commitment, a romance, a lust. And it needs to go beyond that, too, or that's what consummate love is about, is going beyond that and working through as we come to these blocks in the road or blocks in the relationship. Without behavior and expression, passion is lost, and love may revert back to the companionate love. So if we don't keep working on the consummate love, which involves all three of those, or they just fade away, then it goes back to companionate love, where we may still stay together, but it's much more about companions and not necessarily consummate love. Why is Steinberg's triangular theory of love important? According to Steinberg, the importance of each component of love may differ from person to person and couple to couple. All three components are required for the ideal romantic relationship. I want all three of them. <laughs> but the amount of each component required will differ from one relationship to another, or even over time with a relationship. So it may go into the maybe hot romance initially and lust, and then it goes into much more of a sharing kind of and learning about each other and continuing to expand our thoughts about what is our love of that? How do we feel about it? And talk about it. I bet a lot of people don't even do that. The only time they do it is when they're ready to go to a divorce court or something. I haven't liked you for years. <laughs> or you always say this and it makes me mad. Remember, we talked about couples communication in one of these series. I think it was number five, but check it out. Knowing how the components interact may help highlight areas that may need improvement. If we can start to look at where is our relationship with regard to these three components, Steinberg or Sternberg says, that it's a way for us to begin to have a conversation about where we are. For example, recognizing that the passion has gone out of your relationship can help you look for ways to rekindle. Let's have a date night and throw the phones in the sink. No, not really. But let's throw the phones down and start talking instead of reading the phones while we're together. That drives me crazy when I'm in a restaurant and I see two people not talking, just chomping down on their food and reading their cell phones. Oh, what a shallow world we've become. Technology has its stressors and has its aspects that are good, but it's all how we behave. And you know what? That's life in, in anything. It's all about our own attitude. But I don't like that. I even go to the gym. This is picky. But I go to the gym and people are on the cell phone, sometimes talking, but on the cell phone reading constantly. Now, maybe they're reading a book or whatever, but you know what? I want to get in touch with my body when I'm doing my exercises because that is the reason I do exercises. It, it helps me spiritually, emotionally, mentally and physically. And I want to understand when I am at the gym and I'm working on the treadmill or trying to lift five more pounds in some of those stations, how does my body feel? 
dang, some days I have to, it says to me, no, not 60 pounds today. You're not going to do that. I want to pay attention to me. I'm like Toby Keith. Remember his, God bless him, his song, I want to talk about me. (laughs) So sometimes I just want to talk to me, not about me, but just talk to me because I think we lose touch with who we are and just get lost in living a flip-flop life, what I always say. (laughs) So anyway, wrapping this up, I think it's about time. If we're if we find that we're in that passion is gone, what can we do to create some passion? Have a date. Take the cell phones down. Go for a walk in the woods. Talk to the birds. Go for a walk and talk to the birds. That's what I do. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up now, and you may be saying, Good, because we've lived all the seven loves <laughs> and non-love. This look gives us a potential for measuring where we are in our love journey and offers an understanding of the various components of love involved and the starting point for discussion and healing. So I think the thing is, instead of just Going inside yourself and saying, I don't like him anymore. I don't like her anymore. I don't even want to live here anymore. This is, I don't want to work on this job anymore. Find out. Are you passionate about your job? Do you like it? If you don't, do something about it. Don't just start being non-productive at work. And then the next thing you do is you get a write-up and you get out. <laughs> I, I I really want to stress that loving ourselves and loving others does not always have to be about sex and passion, but it's a way to look at ourselves and our relationships and make life more healthy for each of us because stress can destroy who we are. We start looking old early simply because We've been stressed out in our relationship forever and ever and never said anything except to ourselves or in our behavior. Everybody else knew it. Think it's a way for us to start healing, not only ourselves, because we can ask ourselves, am I happy at at my job? Am I happy in this relationship? If I'm not, what do I need to do? Yeah, we always want to say they don't change or this place is getting, no, this is going on in you. And this is a, your responsibility to change the way the relationship is. And I talked about this the last time. Stephen Covey says, all change begins with you. And the, then it impacts those around you. He calls that the circle of influence. It's a way for us to start healing. So I want to look ahead and talk a little bit about number eight. So my next series is number eight. We will discuss what age has to do with attraction, relationships, and love. So what's age got to do with it? Got to do with it. (laughs) What's age? But yeah. Now for sharing, and this is, I always like to end up, So number eight is about, um, has age got anything to do with it? And I'll show you some people that have gotten married and have a beautiful relationship and maybe 30 years difference in their relationship, in their age. We get these biases. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. He's too old or she's too old or she's too young. No. Look at it. Is it in the, is it coming from intimacy, passion? Or the three of them, true love. Because I think most of us don't know what love is. We speak the word, but we don't know because we don't even know ourselves. Now for sharing a couple of quotes. If you remember, I always close with a couple of love quotes. And the first one is this. The fire that we call loving is too strong for human minds. 
but just right for human souls. This was an African-American writer, Aberjami, I believe is the way, but he's an African-American writer. The fire that we call loving is too strong for human minds, but just right for human souls. So I think because we're so conditioned about this is what love is, this is the way it should be, we want to choreograph everything and The next thing we do is we have children. The next thing we do is, yeah, you see what I mean? Love makes your soul crawl out of this hiding hiding place. American artist Zora Neale Hurston. Love makes your soul crawl out of its hiding place. And I think that is very true. In loving, if you look at what Robert Sternberg is talking about, you can see that we may be hiding behind what we think love is. If I don't have lust, then it ain't love. If I don't have, I think that crawling out from our hiding place, and I'm guilty of this myself, is hiding from actual intimacy. Stepping out of the situation because this one didn't do what I wanted it to do and it wasn't the kind of thing. I give up on love and I go into hiding and I know that I'm guilty of that myself. And I think there's a, I I know a lot of people that do that. They may have had a bad result of a relationship and say, I'll never marry again. We don't have to say marry, but we could say, I'm going to continue to love. I'll never love again. No. Guess who you're cheating? Yourself. I want love in my life. And actually, I want a partnership. I want somebody that I can talk about these things with. So I'm not hiding anymore. I'm out there learning on every corner and uh, sometimes wondering now, why were you attracted to this person or why were you attracted to that person? Sometimes we even talk about it. But I want to, the only way I can really find out who I am is to allow myself to step into those moments, step into those situations and experience myself in that. And I think he is absolutely right. The fire that we call loving is too strong for human minds, but just right for the human soul. And so I I find that very true. And I'm going to continue to love till the day I die. And I can find something in everybody that I love. Okay, so here we are at the end. Uh, Love makes your soul crawl out of its hiding place. So get out there and experience love without fear, but with awareness of who you are. And just take Robert Sternberg's three components as a way to measure what's going on with you. So I want to thank you for joining me today in this Hello Self podcast. I am your host, as I mentioned earlier, Patricia Leonard. And remember, our next Law of Attraction podcast will be What's Love Got to Do With It? Remember, we're here to help you turn your cans into cans and your dreams into plans and to get those goals off that someday show. Because now is the perfect time to manifest your dreams and goals. So as I always say, thank you for listening and keep dreaming. Thank you for joining Hello Self today. And may it offer insight and inspire you to stay on your runway to success. Like, share, and subscribe. And remember this, keep dreaming.